I've always seen this in terms of structures and contradictions. So there's no distinction in my mind about how hegemony operates together with on the ground corporate power on the ground. But analytically, it can be quite important to make these distinctions in order to clarify your mind in order to do what I consider the most important work, and that is actually do substantive research on how our world works. And when I say our world, I mean our world, which is dominated by the capitalist mode of production in its contemporary phase, which I like to label as capitalist globalization. And this is why I started to work on architectural iconicity, the way in which buildings and spaces become, quote, iconic. How does that relate to how campus globalization operates? And my very simple answer to this is that iconic architecture is the way in which campus globalization organizes its control exercises its power spatially and visually for the majority of the population of the planet we now live in cities yeah. and big towns. So I've been doing a lot of work in the last five or six years on uh, architectural iconicity. And as I've been working away on this and collecting masses of data on the use of terms icon and iconicity in architecture, uh, I started to notice that iconicity wasn't restricted to architecture, but in the last few years, it started to become a much more general term. So what I've called rather dramatically the icon project reflects my belief that the transnational capitalist class embarks very rarely on courses of action without good reason. It's all planned. It doesn't just happen. And they do a great deal of forward planning. The transnational campus class often embarks on socio-political strategies in order to address contradictions, real or imagined. Those of you who are here you might remember I, I uh, raised the issue of the siege mentality of the capitalist class. And I firmly believe this. The capitalist class, which we on the left see as all powerful, they see themselves as under siege, holding everything together. Because if they don't, everything will break apart. Now, the contradictions to which the ICON project is addressed is at the same time one of the most acknowledged and one of the most intractable <clears throat> of all those besetting capitalism, made even more serious in the age of capitalist globalization. And this is the contradiction of overproduction and underconsumption. Now, I know there's a tremendous debate in political economy circles, and I've been on the edges of the political economy circles for 45 years now. And I, I'm afraid to sound dogmatic, but I, I don't think I'm going to change my mind. There is, particularly in the age of capitalist globalization, particularly in the age of the electronic revolution, with its massive fundamental changes to the mode of production, there is always going to be until the cataclysm occurs, which it surely will one way or the other, uh, a crisis of overproduction and underconsumption. Two sides of the same, I can't seem to get this, right, the same irrational coin on which the capitalist mode of production rests. So what does it mean to say that anything or something or anyone is iconic? Very simple definition which is partly the result of my deep analytic thinking 
and partly the result of reading the mass media all the time on the subject. That's meant to be ironic, by the way. Um, the term is in common usage in the mass media and increasingly in scholarly research. Now, my working definition is that the idea has two defining characteristics. To be iconic, something has to be famous, at least for some communities. So you can have local iconicity, national iconicity, global or transnational iconicity. And second, a judgment of iconicity is a symbolic aesthetic judgment. That is, this thing or person has to have a symbolic meaning, has to stand for something. Not necessarily the same thing to, to different people. And it has to have an aesthetic component to give, a, to give it an edge. Let me give you an example. Writing about the footballer Zinedine Zidane and his red card in the World Cup final in 2006, the famous head-butting incident, uh, Le Monde, the uh, newspaper of record in France, wrote in its editorial, and I'll, I'll give you the translation, with one blow, the icon is smashed. <coughs> okay, how do we analyze this? First of all, Zidane is famous because He's a famous person in a, in a sphere of activity, i.e. football, particularly the World Cup, which probably has more global exposure than any other single event. Symbolically, Zidane becomes very important for France at that time, where there's simply racial, ethnic, class unrest, particularly in the suburbs of Paris, because he's a symbol of North African youth, which has actually achieved something for France. So it's connected in with a sort of national project. But it's not just symbolic for France. It's, I think it's not too far to argue that it's also symbolic for immigrants, colored immigrants, in white societies anywhere. Sudan shows that it can be done. What about the aesthetic component? Well, some filmmaker, whose name escapes me, has made a whole 90 minute documentary film documenting Sudan's touches on the ball during a football match. Now, I am passionately interested in football, but I only watch for like 10 minutes. Uh, but this is the aesthetic component. Uh, it's no more ridiculous than having a 90 minute documentary of uh, Margot Fontaine or, or uh, Darcy Bustle or any other great ballet star dancing for 90 minutes. And when I watch my videos, of great football matches when my team wins and my friends and my family scoff, I say, well, would you scoff if I was just continually listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or rereading Ulysses year after year after year? Of course they wouldn't scoff, but they're snobs. <laughs> okay, enough. Um, so the Icon Project is how I conceptualize the ways in which a fairly long-standing media interest and focus on what is widely known as celebrity culture has been transformed in the last 10 years or so into a much more general and thoroughgoing effort to connect, connect the theme and symbolic aesthetic qualities of people and things with what I've called in my writing the cultural ideology of consumerism. 